stairs. Are you comfortable over there? Uh, well, all packed. Actually, you're very welcome to sit uh, upstage. Uh, because if you sit at the corner, you have a ha actually have a bag to lean on to. It's much more comfortable than sitting over there. So you have the last chance to move upstairs. Who wants to move up now? <laughs> Quickly. Yeah, that's better. And also there are people standing up there. Can you please move forward so that people back there uh, can, can find a place to sit down? Over there, would you move up here as well? Please. Because the people standing up there. Are you hiding your faces? <laughs> Please move forward. Uh, it really is very comfortable sitting up here. Please. Hello, Chin, you want to sit down? Uh, you're not too old to sit down. Please, Lin Le Chin, would you? <laughs> I would love to see you sitting here. Um, Professor Holliday, he was educated at Cambridge and later on he earned his PhD at uh, Oxford. And when you look at these two awesome names, Oxford and Cambridge, you would think, does he come from a long line of elite families in the UK, which was in my head. And um, I did ask him this question, and it turned out that he actually, in his family, he is a first generation college student, college graduate, like myself. Um, you know, with given conversations like this, you, me, I always think, well, we got parents who did a lot for us, you know, previous generation. Um, Professor Holliday, he came to, um, to join, the, join City U, City University of Hong Kong in 1999. And I myself joined City University of Hong Kong in 2003. So when I joined the City University of Hong Kong, Holiday was already Dean of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences at the University, uh, City University of Hong Kong. In 2006, he left City University of Hong Kong, he joined the University of Hong Kong, and I myself joined the University of Hong Kong in 2008. So it turned out that I realized that I've been following his steps all along, <laughs> so I had to bring him to Taipei. Um, in 1999, when um, Ian Holiday came to Hong Kong, he was asked by his friends, how come all of a sudden you jumped so far and you went to Hong Kong? I remember his answer was, well, mm, for adventure. Um, adventure he did have, because after he came to this part of the world, he began to spend his time really studying Southeast Asia, and especially the parts uh, which were formerly the colonies of, um, of the Great Britain. And in his research and his fumbling around, um, this one place attracted his attention, and this place was a long, long ancient history, had been, at that time, had been closed up to the rest of the world for 50 years under military rule. So Ian began to study Burma, or Myanmar, and um, now um, Ian Holiday is one of the leading uh, specialists on Myanmar and Burma. Uh, his newest publication, we just came out a couple months ago, I think. It's called Liberalism and Democracy in Myanmar. He brings his, uh, the HKU students every year to Myanmar, and he also um, is very, um, he, he goes to Myanmar to talk to the local intellectuals, and he understands the society kind of from inside out. Um, so we are really very privileged to have Ian with us today. And I want to tell Ian as well that uh, you also have a very special audience here with you today because the whole island of Taiwan is in engulfed in another topic. <laughs> Everybody is possessed with the topic of election. And on a heavy rainy day, and with election, election being the topic on everybody's mind, then you have such a large turnout. It really shows that we have a very special audience here today. But uh, given this privilege to listen to Professor Holliday, let's welcome Ian Holliday, please. <laughs>
To understand, thank you. I don't begin to understand every aspect of it myself, but it is a fascinating and rewarding journey engaging with Myanmar. And I'm grateful that all of you are here today to speak with me and to discuss with me uh, the issues that face Myanmar as it moves into the 2020s. What I'd like to speak about is a co-authored book that was published yesterday. Um, it's called Liberalism and Democracy in Myanmar, and it's co-authored with my colleague from Lingnam University in Hong Kong, Professor Roman David. Roman actually was born in, the Czech, in what was then Czechoslovakia, uh, now the Czech Republic, and he was an 18-year-old undergraduate student in 1988 when the wall came down in Berlin and Czechoslovakia and many other East European states gained their freedom from um, Soviet oversight and rule. And he became a, a transitions guy, if you like. He, he was first a mathematics teacher, and then he did a PhD in political science, and he's written a lot on transitions in East Central Europe. And I've written on Myanmar. And we've known each other for many years. We've actually written on Myanmar once or twice before. But looking at Myanmar in this decade of transition of the 2010s, there were really two things that struck us about the changes that are sweeping across a previously quite static society. One is very positive that since, I think, 2011, 2011 would normally be the, 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 the conventional date for, uh, uh, start date for the democratization process, Myanmar has gradually shifted away from authoritarian rule. And the landmark event for that was the assumption of office of an NLD government led by Aung San Suu Kyi at the end of March 2016, so about two and a half years ago. That government's about halfway through its five-year mandate. But alongside that, there was something also visible almost from the beginning, particularly from 2012, much less positive, far more troubling, which is a crisis of tolerance that's very, very visible in society, very, very visible in the state. And there the landmark event has been ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya, uh, particularly since August last year, since August 2017, so over the last 15 months. But notably in the explosion of violence that took place after August the 25th last year, and within a matter of weeks had driven more than half a million people across the border into Bangladesh. So it actually took us five years to write this book. And these trends, uh, the landmarks that I've mentioned in 2016, 2017, came while we were writing it. But as I say, the democratization process dates back at least to 2011. And ethnic cleansing at least uh, has, has roots at least as far back as 2012 and much more than that. So we, we saw these two things happening and coming together in the society, and we thought, really, this, this is the big story in Myanmar, is this, this counterpoint, this tension, these, these challenging uh, perspectives on, on the one hand, democratization, and the other, intolerance. And so we wanted to explore that, and that is what our book is about. If, if you wanted a sexier title, it's about democratize, democratization in a time of ethnic cleansing. Uh, but we didn't want to raise the stakes too much, so we've titled it Liberalism and Democracy in Myanmar. The objective is to draw on comparative political science. Of course, Myanmar is not the first state in the world to democratize. We've got plenty of experience around the world of exactly that process. We wanted to learn from all of that and try to gauge the prospects for liberal democracy inside Myanmar. So just to say what I'm not going to be talking about today, this is not an eth ethnographic study of indigenous meanings of either liberalism or democracy. That is a very worthwhile project. And I mentioned Matthew Walton here. His book is about Buddhism and Buddhist political thought in Myanmar. And he does do that for democracy. And he identifies a strand of debate that sees democracy as a, a disciplining force in society and another one that sees it as a rights-based project, and another one that sees it as a moral um, debate within the society or a moral discourse. 
So that's, that's what he's talking about in that book. It's not what we're talking about in our book. Instead, what we're trying to do is to not look inside Myanmar in, in, a, in a kind of deep dive, but instead to look at Myanmar in the context of comparative and comparable experiences and see what they can tell us about the prospects for democracy in, in this particular state. Just a couple of definitions to begin with. We take liberalism in the more classical form, and, and we need to do this because the comparative literature looks for classical liberal pillars that underpin liberal democracy. So we're looking at liberalism as protection of individual rights, promotion and protection of individual rights and freedoms. A very classical conception leading back to, say, John Locke, coming forward through someone like John Stuart Mill. We're not so concerned with modern conceptions of, of liberalism that stress social rights and social justice. And for democracy, we have a very simple definition, a political system based on universal suffrage and free, fair, and comprehensive elections. So those are some markers that we put down at the beginning, just to be clear about what it is we're discussing in the Myanmar case. This is Myanmar. Um, in your very useful briefing pack put together by the foundation, you have a lot of this background. So I'm not going to go through that in too much detail. But the point I made at the beginning, maybe just before they switched the microphones on, so it may not have reached the back of the hall, but this is a very, very, very complex country. Um, it came into the modern age largely through British imperialism, and that was a point that Dr. Lung made earlier, that this is why it piqued my interest. I felt you can't live in Asia as a British person without understanding the backstory in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Malaysia, and in, in now in Myanmar. Um, Myanmar was colonized in three phases. First, coastal Myanmar in the 1820s, then lower Myanmar in the 1850s, and then upper and the whole of Myanmar, of course, then called Burma by the British in the 1880s. That wasn't the end of the complexity, it was really the start of it, because when the British colonized Burma, they didn't make it a freestanding colony. They made it a part of the Indian Raj. So they stitched it onto India, and it became another province of India. It was not until 1937 that the British created a freestanding colony of Burma. And that meant that the, that the elite in colonial Burma was European, and the middle-ranking strata of society were South Asian. Um, the army was staffed in the middle ranks by South Asians, not by Europeans and not by Burmans. The civil service and the post office were run in the middle ranks by South Asians and not by Europeans or by Burmans. So you had Europeans, South Asians, and Burmans. And that led to all sorts of difficulties in the post-colonial uh, period. Rangoon in the 1930s was about 65% South Asian, um, with small populations of Europeans and Burmans. And part of the difficult heritage that Burma has to this day, or Myanmar has to this day, derives from that. The British also ruled Burma differentially in the, in the Burman core and all of the minority peripheral areas. So, Roughly 65% of the population is Burma, Myanmar, Burma people. They are Burman under the old British understanding. The other one third are Kachin, Shan, Mon, Karen, Rakhine, all sorts of minority peoples. The British imposed direct rule on the Burmans and indirect rule on everybody else. So everybody else kept their princes, their sorbois, um, and Shan State was still run by its hereditary, traditional hereditary rulers. In the core of Burma, that wasn't the case. And this also stored up a lot of conflict for the post-independence period. British rule was interrupted by Japanese rule for three years in World War II. Democracy came at independence and survived until 1962. Never particularly successful. Uh, never delivered on its objectives of creating a Buddhist welfare state 
for the Burmese people and was destroyed by a military coup in 1962. Autocracy, first state socialist, looking a lot like East Central Europe, subsequently state capitalist, looking like a crony form of capitalism, survived for 50 years, and also turned Burma into a hermit state. Just about everybody was driven out in the early 1960s. The Ford Foundation went, the Fulbright Commission went, Christian missionaries went, many South Asians went, many corporations went. By 1970, there was one foreign corporation in Burma, and that was a German armaments manufacturer that was close to the dictator General Ne Win. So it's a very, very isolated uh, country, subject to a lot of propaganda, uh, full censorship in those years, and um, only in, in 2011 was military rule finally dissolved and a quasi-civilian system put in place. It's a country today of officially 51.5 million, though everybody knows that's an undercount because, for instance, the Rohingya were not counted in the census that took place in 2014. There are officially 135 national races, though they're nested within eight major national races. So that's the Shan and the Kachin and the Mon and the Karen and the Chin and the Rakhine. Those are the eight major national races. But inside, there are uh, further divisions. 88% is officially Buddhist. The other 12% are Christian, Hindu, Muslim, and animist. And when the UNDP did the Human Development Index for this year, 2018, it ranked Myanmar at 148 out of 189. That may not sound too bad, but almost all of the countries underneath Myanmar are, are in sub-Saharan Africa. So Myanmar is actually part of a little small Asian cluster with Pakistan and Nepal. They are 1489 and 150. There's only one Asian country below those three, and that's Afghanistan. So it's doing very poorly by Asian standards. Uh, what we did was we talked to more than 3,000 people. We did some elite interviews from 2014 to 2018, and we did three waves of surveys and survey experiments, and I'll be reporting some of the results from those surveys in just a minute. We covered about, the areas that we, we looked into contain about 44% of the Myanmar population. So we wanted some of our um, respondents to be in Burma areas. That was Yangon region, Mandalay region. Those are two of the three largest regions in the country. We also wanted some of our respondents to be in the non burma parts of the country, so we went to Kachin State, Kayin State, and Shan State to interview people there. And what I'm about to report in the next five slides after this one, I have one slide on each of these headings, are um, different perspectives on the liberal foundations of democracy in Myanmar. So what we learned from the comparative literature in political science was that if you want to sustain a democracy, if you want to consolidate a democracy, then you need to have liberal foundations in the wider society. It's very rare for democracy to survive without those wider liberal foundations. Um, you find very few instances of stable, lasting democracy without those wider liberal foundations in the society. And so we looked, if you like, at Myanmar from five different angles. One was we looked at the history, um, what was coming into this transition from the past. Second, we looked at the constitution and, and the political framework of, of the political system. Third, we looked at the elite uh, and their relationship with the mass, the theater of democracy, if you like, the actors on the stage and the audience and how those two interact. Uh, how the audience responds to the actors on the stage, whether they seek to uh, applaud or heckle or leave the theater, what, what's going on there. We then looked at social relations. Let's get away from politics completely. And we asked people, 
questions about living with others in their neighborhood, shopping in stores owned by people who were not from their particular group in society, doing business with people across ethnic or religious fault lines. We were interested in asking completely non-political questions. And then we also finally looked at dealing with the past because most societies coming out of authoritarianism turn around and look back and decide how they should deal with that. Should they have, for instance, a truth commission, as in South Africa? Should they put people on trial? Should they seek to um, make up for the wrongs that were perpetrated to recompense? All of these sorts of issues. And, and most successful transitions to democracy have something of that. So we wanted to look at these five different perspectives. And the next five slides are about these five things. Now, the historical legacy is not good, um, but this is not unusual. The whole point about a transition is that it takes you from an authoritarian space into a democratic space. So it's not as if you expect the past already to be liberal, already to be democratic. But I would say Myanmar had a particularly difficult historical legacy to, to grapple with. Colonialism was, of course, illiberal, um, often very violently so. Um, the pacification of Burma, and that's a term that was used by the British, not by anybody looking an, on from the outside, but the pacification of Burma was a lot like the pacification of Iraq after 2003. This was a society that did not take colonialism easily. It fought, it resisted, and for 20 years from the 1880s into the early part of the 19th century, there was open conflict in many parts of the society. There wasn't a single decade of the colonial experience that did not see some eruption of rebellion or revolt. So in the early parts, it was, it was um, low-grade fighting, shooting. Subsequently, when the British had largely put the lid on that, it was Buddhist monks who then, as later on, led the anti-colonial struggle. Why Buddhist monks? Because all other forms of politics had been shut down by the British. But they couldn't shut down religion, and so a lot of protests then took, took place through the monkhood. Then it was students. Aung San Suu Kyi's father, Aung San, was a student at the University of Rangoon in 1920, which is when it was formed, sorry, in the 1930s, having been formed in 1920. In fact, most of the independence elite were students in the 1930s. He himself died at 32, the age of 32. He'd made his name as a student leader in the 1930s. So layered on top of colonialism and all of the illiberalism that was part of that experience was authoritarianism from 1962 to 2011. This was a very special authoritarianism in that it turned Burma into a hermit state. I already mentioned all the people who'd been pushed out. But there was also no real engagement with the wider world. Um, this, of course, there was no internet then. There were no real forest, foreign correspondents. There were almost no tourists. For some short period, the longest visa you could get to travel to Burma was 24 hours. For, that was very brief. But for many years, the longest you could get was seven days to, in, to, to enter Burma, run around, and then um, get out within the seven days. So this was a very isolated society, subject to state propaganda on a daily basis. Um, it had no experience of the post-colonial debates that were taking place in many other former colonies. So decolonization, of course, triggered widespread debate in many parts of, the, of the, what we call the third world, but not in Burma. Burma was not part of that. It had no experience of civil rights debates in America and in many other parts of the world in the 60s and the 70s. All these engulfing social uh, movements and debates that took place in many other societies around the world, and somehow or another, affected most societies. Burma was not part of those. And this is one of the underlying explanations for why it's finding democracy so difficult today. 
because it's a society that is suddenly, very suddenly, open to a whole range of debate that it has no experience of from the past. Ethnic conflict, um, I mentioned that the British ruled Burma differently in the core from on the periphery. Uh, that already had consequences in World War II when the periphery was loyal to the Allies and the Burman core was largely allied with the Japanese. So in World War II, there were atrocities taking place across ethnic lines uh, as Burmans fought Karens and Burmans fought Kachin. And this too has legacies down to today and social exclusion, uh, particularly of the Rohingya, uh, that's by no means a story only of the transition, but also has precursors. And one of the two of the books we looked at, Jack Snyder's From Voting to Violence and Michael Mann's The Dark Side of Democracy, um, both quite obvious from the title what they're talking about, you know, the dark side of democracy obviously is the, the um, there are welcome civil movements that emerge in a democratic transition, but there are also nationalist movements and xenophobic and exclusive movements that emerge, and that is Michael Mann's dark side of democracy, visibly on display today in Myanmar. And one of the commentators on Michael Mann's book wrote this, and I think it's the best short statement, the sudden introduction of modern forms of mass politics into deeply undemocratic societies can lead to disasters, including ethnic cleansing and genocide. And I wrote on these things in the 2000s, drawing explicitly on this literature and arguing that nation building was an absolutely necessary prerequisite for successful democratization in Myanmar. Just to mention the constitution, this is a constitution for discipline flourishing democracy. That is what the military calls um, this. It doesn't pretend that it's a democracy without qualification. It's discipline flourishing democracy. And the discipline comes from uh, safeguards for military rule that have been inserted into the constitution. So whilst Aung San Suu Kyi leads a cabinet dominated by the NLD, there are three ministers in there who report not to her, not to the president, but to the commander in chief. They are serving military officers, not retired, serving military officers who report to the commander in chief. And they're in charge of all internal and external uh, security. The legislature has 25% military appointees, again, not retired officers, serving military officers in both houses of the national parliament and in all 14 regional or territorial assemblies. They tend to be rotated on an annual basis, so they don't go native and feel as if they're more parliamentarian than, than soldier. They remain soldiers throughout. The bureaucracy, appointments to the bureaucracy are over, or to the state are overseen by those military ministers. And the constitution has a whole chapter on emergency provisions. If things start to get out of hand, then it's okay for the military to step in and declare a state of emergency. So another author has called this a license to coup. We found in our surveys in 2014 and 2017 that people reject military rule. We also found that they're increasingly supporting this hybrid system. This is not a normal democracy. It's a hybrid system. But from 2014, fairly balanced. You know, the question obviously was, do you think your, the system is democratic or not democratic? 2014, largely balanced. 2017, democratic was, was mostly the answer. Only one major thing has changed in the intervening period. The NLD has been elected to government. Now, that was a great victory for the, the opposition in Myanmar, but it changed nothing structurally. It did not make Myanmar more democratic. All of the structures in the constitution remained in place, but the, the military has actually been quite successful in convincing people that discipline flourishing democracy is democracy. Elite and mass actors, this is a complex slide and I'm afraid I won't be able to go through it in all the detail I really should because of time constraints. But I mentioned at the beginning that Matt Walton had three main uh, strands of democratic discourse in Myanmar. And those three strands are visibly uh, represented in contemporary Myanmar. So on the military side and the party that's al allied, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, the USDP, allied with the military, they believe in disciplined democracy. That's Walton's term. Their own term is disciplined flourishing democracy. 
The NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, historically set up in 88, the great uprising in 1988 for democracy. They believe in, in classic rights-based democracy, officially. And activist monks who've become key political players this decade would be moral democracy, um, a democracy that has some moral elevation as, as part of its program. Broadly, ethnic parties are marginalized. They are not major political players. The peace process is stalled. It's not going anywhere. Political participation is relatively limited for a transitional state and relatively trans uh, traditional. There are new NGOs, CBOs, um, organizations operating in communities that are very contemporary. But on the whole, people engage through the Buddhist faith and through their temples um, alongside monks. Our feeling is that there is a triangular politics going on here and that monks ultimately are going to be the, the deciding force between the military on the one side and democratic forces on the other. And on some issues, they swing to one, one side and on some issues to the other. One remarkable thing about the Myanmar transition is that even though there's been ethnic cleansing taking place in Rakhine State, there are no major uh, dissenting voices. Nobody has stood up from within the political elite to challenge what's happened in Rakhine State. Nobody stood up to challenge anything else that's happening um, in, in Myanmar politics. It's, it's, it's a, a, a dog that didn't bark, uh, the, the fact that dissent is pretty much invisible within the political elite. And that, I think, is also worrying. The fact that people tend to cohere broadly around the same agenda. Um, and it, at the mass level, not that much political engagement. As, as you might expect, you know, if China were ever to democratize, I, I guess you'd expect the same thing because people have been conditioned for so long to think that politics is, is, is not a particularly safe space. There's been a truly dark side of civic action because a lot of the anti-Muslim re rhetoric, of course, comes from senior monks um, and sometimes from junior monks. Maybe the, uh, the greatest ray of hope on this slide is that the most solidly liberal people in the society are NLD voters, and the NLD won a great majority in the 2015 election. I said earlier, for social relations, we wanted to get away from politics and to talk to people about just their relationships with other groups. You're a Bama Buddhist. How do you feel about dealing with Christians and Muslims? How do you feel about dealing with people from the official ethnic minorities, or from Chinese, or with Chinese people, or with British people, or with Bangladeshis? We ask these kinds of questions. This looks difficult in terms of there's all those percentages there, but it, it, it has a very, very striking message in this slide. This is percentages of dislikes for 2014 and 2017. That's what's in the brackets. And it shows you the social distance from Bama Buddhists. So we ask these questions of everybody. But if you ask the Bama Buddhists, how much would you dislike on the first line there? And, and this is having a neighbor on your street from. So we also asked all the other questions about uh, shopping with, working with, trading with. We asked all those questions, but this question is, how much would you dislike having a neighbor on your street from all those other things, an, an official ethnic minority, blah, blah, blah. So, Bama Buddhists do not dislike having official ethnic minorities at all. Only four to, uh, six to eight percent in 2014, even less in 2017. So, the official minorities and the majority have come together during the period of ethnic cleansing. They own this state and they have really pulled together. So almost no dislike at all among Bama Buddhists of having a Kachin next door, a Shan down the street, a Mon li living opposite. That's just fine with them. Christian, Hindu, Chinese, Indian, in a kind of middle range, not particularly welcome. Um, in 2014, 2017, 43 to 59% disliked that. In 2017, 48 to 67%, so worsening. Again, the pulling together of the official um, majority and minorities against everybody else. 
And then on the very far uh, margins of society, Muslim, Bangladeshi, Rohingya. The first of those numbers, 72 and 82, is for, is for Muslims. And the last of those numbers, 83% in 2014, 94% in 2017, is for the Rohingya. So in 2017, last year, when we asked people, how much would you dislike, when we asked Burma Buddhists, how much would you dislike having a Rohingya living on your street, 94% said we would dislike that. How much would you like or dislike? 94% said we would dislike that. So you've got these orbits of social distance. You've got the official ethnic minorities very close, even though there's still ongoing civil war or civil conflict in Kachin State and Northern Shan State. There are not serious ethnic fault lines among the official minorities and the majority. They can live with each other. And ultimately, I think the peace process can succeed on that basis. Christian, Hindu, Chinese, Indian, a bit more worrying, but that pales into insignificance when you look at the place of the Muslims, the Bangladeshis, and the Rohingya. Um, there's a, an ex, a, a degree to which state policy is, is driving this intolerance. I mentioned before that this was a hermit state subject to uh, brazen state propaganda for 50 years. There are constitutional inequalities, the official religion is, is no longer Buddhism. It was before, but it's not, in fact, now. But Buddhism has a special place. Um, some minorities are official. Others are not mentioned, i.e. the Rohingya. There are citizenship, identity card, and census issues. The Rohingya were not part of the census. They were not allowed until the day before the census took place. There was the option of a write-in. You could write in your identity. But that was, at, in the end, withdrawn. And in 2014, a series of intermarriage and religious laws were passed requiring, for instance, Buddhist women to get official state permission to marry outside their faith, and particularly with a Muslim. Also requiring Muslim women not to, ha not to have babies on, on anything more than a two-year cycle. These sorts of laws were passed. So when you look at in the society and you only ask non-political questions, you find that this is a multi-ethnic society. It's somewhat multi-faith in that Hindu, Chinese are somewhat accept, uh, accepted. But it has xenophobic undercurrents and it has an Islamophobic mainstream. So Islamophobia is mainstream in Myanmar. It's not on the margins. 94% would dislike having a Rohingya as a neighbor, 82% would dislike having a Muslim as a, as a neighbor. It has an Islamophobic mainstream. And finally, we looked at how dealing with the past. There's only been one really serious measure of transitional justice uh, implemented in transitional Myanmar, which again is unusual, and that is release of political prisoners. So there are still some political prisoners, maybe 150, but Mass incarceration for political crimes is now a thing of the past. Um, what we found is there's a lot of support for transitional justice. Everything is over 50%, and I've described the four different types of transitional justice there. Um, but there's not much interest within the elite. Aung San Suu Kyi herself said last year that those who promote this agenda are, are, are creating roadblocks on our path to democracy. Now, this wasn't one of the chapters I mentioned at the beginning, but it is something that came to us as we were putting together uh, our findings and really scrutinizing our data, which is there were some very puzzling things going on in Myanmar when we looked at the kinds of beliefs that people held firm to. We found that 20 to 30% believed in democracy, but also in military rule. That 20 to 40% like their democratic constitution, even though it has Clause 59F that prevents Aung San Suu Kyi from becoming president. And maybe it's not surprising that 50% of men thought that men make better leaders, but 52% of women also thought that. And what we devised was a concept of limited liberalism. This is not believing in consistent things on, 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 in different areas, not believing... Um, in, 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 in liberalism over there 
and in illiberalism somewhere over here. This was having liberal and illiberal views in the same area, in the same broad um, domain. So maybe believing in the principle of something, but not in the application. Um, and I've got a slide, the next slide will, will, will give you a bit more detail on that. We feel that this is a critical way of understanding a hybrid regime, and it can help us to understand where it's going to go in the future. So if I try to say in a little bit more detail, we looked at ethnic and religious equality as part of Myanmar's political culture. Do you believe in equality for all of our ethnic groups? Do you believe in equality for all faith groups? Some people said yes, but not for the Muslims. Um, that, to us, is a case of limited liberalism. We also looked at interfaith marriage. Do you believe that people should be able to marry across religious lines? Very few people said yes, uh, consistently. Only 3% were liberal down the line on interfaith marriage. But some people said, yes, we believe in that as a principle, but we don't think that Buddhists should be allowed to marry Muslims. So again, that was... And what you can see here is that from 20, this is not yet a trend. You know, two data points can't give you a trend. But from 2014 to 2017, strikingly, liberals are stagnant, exactly stagnant in both of those areas. Limited liberals and liberals are growing, or at least more willing to declare themselves. The percentage of limited liberals plus liberals is 17% up in both of those areas across the three years. So this is worrying. This is not a liberalizing society. This is either a more limited liberal or more illiberal society. Okay, final slide. So we started off with this question, what are the prospects for liberal democracy? And we wanted to draw on the comparative literature to point us to the sorts of things that could help us answer that question. Where should you look if you want to have some understanding of how this transition is doing? So we looked to the comparative literature for some pointers and the various slides I've just presented uh, are the areas we looked in. I want to stress that the change that took place in 2011 was absolutely fundamental. The shift from rule by junta to electoral politics was path-breaking for Myanmar. But for us, elections are necessary but not sufficient components of democracy. Where there are huge challenges are in the paucity of the limited range of liberal commitments, the acceptance of a hybrid political system, that is growing, intolerance, that is growing, and I haven't said much about this, but pursuit of democracy without democratic leadership, that's basically a criticism of Aung San Suu Kyi, who is trying to build democracy while herself not even being democratic as the leader of her own party, and, and, and not really infusing the system with democratic values. So. Our assessment is somewhat bleak, drawing on all of this data that the comparative literature invited us to look at. The one final point is, of course, the fate of the transition always rests with the Myanmar people. I mean, just because there are these worrying signs in intolerance and in a lack of liberal commitments doesn't mean to say that the Myanmar people cannot, in fact, make a consolidated democracy but um, the signals are not good as, as of the present. So thank you very much for your attention. This is on. The other one is not. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. It's very, very, um, 
inspiring. Um, I think I'm going to shoot off with two questions so that the audience has time to get ready for your questions. Um, the first one is about the monks. We know that in, in 1988, actually the monks kind of uh, uh, were leading the, the transition, the change, were challenging the status quo at that time. That shows to us that the monks actually, they, among the Buddhists, they took a stand. Uh, that also means that they do have their value system at work. So they made a judgment. Now, this is no more to be tolerated and something must be done. Okay. Now, when we are faced with the, the ethnic cleansing now that we're witnessing, um, my question is, well, it turns out that the Buddhists themselves are the perpetrators. And there are very, very little dissenting voices. So how do you explain this? What happens to the Buddhist philosophy with their concept of human rights? Um, so what's happening there? Well, thanks very much, Ying Tai, for that question. In fact, in 88, the monks were not leading, though they were participating. The students were leading in 88, but they did lead in 2007. So the Saffron Uprising in 2007, named because of the robes that they wear. And famously, they, they marched past Dong San Suu Kyi's gate. She's still under house arrest at the time. Um, she comes to the gate in tears, and they acknowledge her, and she acknowledges them. So it looks like a perfect meeting between the democratic icon, Aung San Suu Kyi, at her gate, and the monks filing past. Um, and this is only you know, 11 years ago. So how on earth did ethnic cleansing happen 10 years later, 2007, 2017? Um, it seems almost inconceivable that there could be this change around. But the, the Myanmar monkhood is, 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 is far more complex than that. I, I mean, you always had a hierarchy which was largely co-opted by the military. Um, so that the, the senior, the, the Sangha, is the name for the monkhood. But the senior monks were always a very conservative force in the society. They gained, um, they gained in their monasteries, in that the, the generals have always given very generously to build new temples and uh, to, to, to make some merit in the society. They gained personally. They gained televisions. They gained cars. Um, they gained a lot, of, a, a, a lot of access in the society. So they were never the ones, A, they were never the ones on the street. They were the, never the ones who were kind of leading um, the direction of, 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 of Buddhism within the society. It was younger monks who were leading the Saf Saffron Revolution in 2007. And what we've seen in the last decade is that there's still a lot of radicalism among many of the younger monks. But now the older monks have been politicized. They no longer have this kind of insider channel to the military. They're in many ways just part of civil society. They're just out there. And it, looking back, just, just in the kind of landscape of the cities, you used to walk down the street of, say, Yangon or Mandalay or, or, or a major Myanmar town. You scarcely notice the monasteries. When you go today, they're absolutely festooned with flags. And on the weekends, senior monks, not junior monks, but senior monks are setting up stall on 32nd Street this Saturday, on 33rd Street next Saturday, on 34th Street the next Saturday. They clear the entire street, they put down rush matting. The faithful come, they congregate, and they listen to senior monks telling them that the most important challenge for the faith now is defending the faith. So it's become very, very core. It's no longer other issues like, say, democracy or the living standards of the people which used to be among their concerns, it's now we are under attack from Muslims, from global Islam, um, from this, there's a, there's a kind of existential challenge to the country. And so the senior leaders of the monkhood are now coming out and telling the Myanmar people that they need to mobilize against the global Islamic threat, and in particular, against the threat that they see in their own society. So it's a different cohort of monks that are political today, compared with 2007. And the agenda has really come home to them um, as one of defending the faith, rather than of seeking all sorts of peripheral benefits for the people. 
So are you saying that what they are doing now is no different from what they have done before? In other words, are you saying that the the Buddhist monks um, have they have never been the so-called progressive forces in the society, unlike what, for example, what the Catholic Catholics did in the Eastern Bloc before 1989? They've been both. I mean, they've been conservative and they've been progressive, and they still are. They still are to this day, but. Um, because of the events in Rakhine State and the whole mobilization against what is seen as a terrorist threat from Asa, from the Arakan Rohingya uh, Salvation Army, um, senior monks are now mobilizing the faithful around that. But it's, it's a very complex movement. There are 500,000 monks in Myanmar. Um, half a million you know, people devote themselves to Buddhism, live their lives as Buddhist monks. And within that half a million, there are these different cohorts, senior and junior. Uh, they're still existing in tension with each other. You can still find monks today, we interviewed some of them, who feel there's no place for the kind of uh, rhetoric which is now issuing forth from, from the senior monkhood. But they have become ascendant uh, on the back of this, this Islamic challenge as it's seen. I mean, I mean, the other thing that's changed is just the explosion of social media. There are 20 million people out of 50 million in Myanmar are on Facebook. Um, and Burmese language Facebook is a very frightening place to be. I mean, it's absolutely full of openly racist and xenophobic rhetoric, some of it coming from, from Buddhist monks. Um, and, 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 and so their reach has become also very extensive. Um. The Rohingyas are not the only Muslims who are living in Myanmar, and there are recognized Muslim states as well, or minorities as well. So two questions in relation to this. One, um, the way was this uh, ethnic cleansing, did other um, Muslim minorities speak up? Do they have an attitude about this? And two, so why are the Rohingya Muslims targeted? Yeah. Um, one of the official 135 ethnic minorities is the Kaman Muslim group, K-A-M-A-N, uh, which is resident in Rakhine State, just as the Rohingya largely are. Um, so they do have official status. They have had all the way through. Um, so on your first question, so. No, the Rohingya are not the only Muslim group. There are, there are Chinese Muslims in Myanmar. There are um, Myanmar Muslims who seek a kind of assimilationist. I mean, to all intents and purposes, they are mainstream Myanmar people, except that they, they uh, are, have an Islamic faith. And then there, there are the more aggressive um, Muslims who are promoting some form of identity politics. So that's also very complex. Um, did other groups speak up? No, uh, largely not. And in fact, some of the people that we interviewed were critical of the Rohingya for endangering the security of other Muslims in the society. So that's, that's, a, that's very uh, difficult. We, there's a lot of self-segregation going on in Myanmar. There used to be neighborhoods in Yangon, in Mandalay, that were ethnically and religiously mixed. They may still be ethnically mixed, but they're not religiously mixed anymore. There's a, there's a known Muslim quarter. Buddhists moved out, Muslims moved in. Um, and, and, and Myanmar people, often you can talk to people who are very liberal on every single issue, uh, except on this one, when they're extremely illiberal. I was at a conference a few years ago with one of my doctoral students who's a Myanmar Muslim. He's studying... Uh, lack of social integration between Muslims and Buddhists in Myanmar. And he gave a very good and basic presentation at the conference about that. The next morning I'm having breakfast and this person who I knew fairly well came over to see me, chat, chat, chat. And then at a certain point he said, is that guy yesterday, is he your student? And I said, yes, yes he is. And he said, you shouldn't let him out in a public place to say things like that. Um, this is one of the most right on or liberal persons I know who said that. Why are the Rohingya targeted? Well, um, it goes back to World War II when there was a, there was a, 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 a at the time of the Japanese um, interregnum from 42 to 45. 
Rakhine State, which is about as far from Rangoon as it was then as you can get, you know, it's very distant, was largely lawless. And there was a Muslim insurgency then. And there were concerns then that part of Burma might become part of what was then East, what was to become East Pakistan, you know, before Bangladesh, East Pakistan at independence. So there's always been those kinds of concerns that this is a frontier land uh, with a people who identify with a religion belonging to the neighbor rather than the majority religion of, of this place, um, that they might be seeking some kind of status which could either mean a loss of territory on the margins or even in, in the worst telling could mean that Burma itself becomes an, an Islamic state. It, it seems crazy to all of us given the 4%. But for Myanmar people, they will tell you that many parts of Southeast Asia were not Muslim until a century ago or two centuries ago, but have become Muslim. And they see themselves as really the last defenders of the faith, uh, maybe alongside, say, the Thais. So when I use this term existential, they see it as an existential crisis. Ian, could you say a few words about what you mentioned a while ago, about the dividing line between the coast, uh, the, the periphery, uh, Burmese and the core Burmese. And the reason why I'm asking you this is because I read some um, um, history uh, uh, records about the, the about, about three years, between 1942 and 1945, when the Japanese armies were in, in Burma. And um, so I, the, the Japanese uh, accounts actually recorded that the, the local Burmese people were helping the Japanese, mm. fighting against the Allies. Okay, so apparently inside, the, internally there was the divide. And does this divide have anything to do with the problems that we are witnessing nowadays? It does. I mean, the, the independence settlement in 1947, uh, just ahead of independence in January 1948, provided for secession after 10 years for a number of named minorities. Very unusual for a constitution to say that. It was kind of, let's give this place, independent Burma, a 10-year window. And if we haven't pulled it all together at the, the end of the 10 years, then secession is a possibility for these named states. That disappeared in 62. The constitution was, was trashed in 62 with the military coup. But um, you already had you know, an evidently patchwork state. And, and the sense among many of the minorities was that they'd fought with the British, they'd been loyal to the British. And by the British, they had been promised a better deal at independence, not to just get folded into Burma, but to be given Karen land, or a Kachin state, these kinds of things. Um, what our data show is that that's actually not as big an issue as you might expect. I mean, that reading of would you dislike as a neighbor on your street, somebody from one of the official ethnic minorities, and the Burma Buddhists, only 5% say, we, yes, we would dislike that. Everybody else is fine with that. Suggests that you can actually build bridges across those fault lines. And, I think the propaganda around the 135 national races has been very, very successful. It's made those 135 part of the family. It's made everybody else definitely not part of the family, which is where the Rohingya are, because they are not named. I should say one other thing about the Rohingya. Giving them, making them number 136 on that list doesn't necessarily give them their own homeland. One of the pieces in the briefing pack suggests that should they be named as an official ethnic minority, they would automatically get a Rohingya homeland. That's not the case. Um, they would simply get citizenship. So there aren't 135 homelands in Burma, in Myanmar. There are, there's a Burma core and seven named states, Kachin state, Karen state, Shan state. Nobody's talking about Rohingya state, um, but it's a question of citizenship for people who call themselves Rohingya. My last question. We know that Ian is also a collector of um, uh, Myanmar art, especially from the living artists uh, who live in, in Myanmar. Um, and you, um, 
socialize and you know these artists as well. So when you are in there and you are having a conversation with the local artists there, um, what do you get from them? How do you understand the intellectual climate there? Because I noticed something very interesting. Um, when you come to Taiwan or, or many, many countries and you want to get to know kind of an intellectual climate there, you probably talk to writers. Mm -hmm. But you specifically say you get that from talking to painters there. So what do you get? What kind of picture do you get when you talk to the local painters who have lived all their lives there and then they would get out of the country? How do they feel about the whole thing? Let me just, thanks very much for that. I mean, let me just say what I think is interesting about painters, which is that they, they require no interpretation um, in the sense that you can take their painting and you can display it and it is still an authentic statement by a Myanmar person living through this moment in time. Whereas if you take the writings of a Myanmar writer, nobody in this audience can read it, or maybe one or two. Um, it has to be translated, it has to be interpreted. Now, we may not interpret the painting in the way a Myanmar person would, but nevertheless, it's an authentic document. And I do think it's absolutely essential that the wider world understand this complex country far better than it has done. It is not a black and white country, even though that's how we've seen it for years. It used to be Aung San Suu Kyi versus the generals. Now it's everybody else versus the Rohingya. But this is a country of just infinite shades of gray, and it needs to be understood on those terms. And, and, and one way of doing that is by um, looking at authentic documents. And, and, and as I say, we may not get every message that's in a, in a Burmese painting, but it is itself an authentic document. So what do they say? Unfortunately, they say much the same as everybody else about the Rohingya. I mean, this really goes deep into the society. I, the, the person I quoted criticizing my PhD student is emblematic of Myanmar intellectuals. And as I say, without a break in the conversation, it's not as if they, uh, they're talking about female empowerment, they're talking about gay rights or whatever, and then they say, but also I believe in this, and I apologize for that. It's seamless. They see no contradiction whatsoever in holding their array of liberal views and then something that we would find deeply illiberal and, and abhorrent. Um, so on, on, on those kinds of issues, they're, they're mainstream, frankly. And the mainstream is, is extremely wide. And it encompasses pretty much everybody. Um, on other issues, they're a bit more interesting. They've always been deeply critical of Aung San Suu Kyi. You know, she's, she's loved throughout the country, but if you want to find a Myanmar person who, can, who is prepared to take her on, so to speak, then speak to a Yangon intellectual. Because she's not embraced them, they in return do not embrace her. And this was true even before she became state councillor, even back in, 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 in 2011, 12, 13. She's never built the big tent. She's never reached out to the 88 generation students when the candidate list for the 2015 general election was drawn up by the NLD, in fact, by Aung San Suu Kyi. There was one person from the 88 generation student movement on that list and not a major figure. We'd all expected that she would reach out to the students who'd been not under house arrest for 15 out of 20 years, but in jail for 20 out of 20 years and were released in, 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 you know, from appalling conditions. Um, we all thought, the, the Burma watchers and Myanmar watchers, that this would become part of her coalition, but it never did. And nor does she reach out to the new kind of civil society leaders. Um, she has almost no contact with them. She is not inviting them to Naypyidaw for, for advice or discussion, um, mirroring how she runs her party. I mean, her party is a, really a reflection of a charismatic leader. It is a charismatic party. Uh, the, there's only one woman in the cabinet named Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, there were only 15% women on the NLD candidate list. There were no Muslims, not even one. And I mean, the candidate list is about 1,150 names. So just 15% women, no Mus not a single Muslim name. This is all deeply worrying when th we're talking about the major vehicle of democracy, the NLD. Very few women and no Muslims. She should get along with Trump very well. <laughs> <laughs> I have to open up now. <laughs>
So uh, uh, I'll t we'll take questions from the audience. And uh, may I ask you to keep your question very precise and short so that uh, he could listen to more questions. And also, if you uh, don't feel comfortable uh, uh, raise your question in English is fine with Chinese. Okay, so um, shall we? Uh, this one first, number one, and two, and we take three at one time. One, two, three. All right, there, please. And please keep your questions brief. Um, Dr. Holiday, again on um, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, I know that the uh, UN had issued a, uh, a report in August uh, basically reprimanding the military leaders of Myanmar for the genocide against the um, Rohingya uh, Muslims. But um, to the whole international media, Aung San Suu Kyi seems to be taking the fall for the whole thing. You know, they're retracting her reward, uh, awards and all that kind of thing. Um, considering her present status, which is sort of like a shadow president and um, the fairly concentrated participation of the military in the parliament and her basically loss of control over the military. I mean, doesn't, does she even have the power to do anything? Um, does she have any executive power? Or is this all very unfair simply because she has been so idolized? Thank you. Thanks very uh, Shall we take three. three all together? Yeah. Mm. And by the way, uh, Guo Zi is a lawyer who grew up in Myanmar. Yes. Okay. No, uh, please. Mm. Uh, I want to know uh, when the Myanmar begin to have a written history. Uh, as far as I know, for example, in Korea and the Vietnam, uh, there uh, in Chinese uh, historical book, contain the history of Korea and the Vietnam. Might be in Chinese historical book, so-called 24 histori historical book, might contain some information about uh, Burma's history. Uh, so that might be useful for you. Okay, thank you. And the next one, please. Is it up? Uh, uh, at the studying at the Department of Southeast Asian Study, and my question is, of course, uh, I'm not agreed on that uh, how how Aung San Suu Kyi replied to the international community about his uh, stand on the human right. But uh, my question is, uh, uh, as you all know that uh, Myanmar just uh, had uh, opened up in 2010 or 11, but actually, like you, like uh, doctor said, we have a complex country with a uh, how to say semi uh, democracy. No, not a normal. Uh, it's a hybrid democracy, and somehow in the other way the. The population, like uh, uh, from your data, the 94% dislike uh, Rohingya. And actually, the Rohingya issue is, uh, uh, is only the name for Rohingya. Actually, before, uh, before 2011, there were also a lot of uh, mass caring in the central dry zone of Myanmar, just be in the central of Myanmar. Uh, mass killing of uh, Muslim. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, Rohingya issue came out just because of uh, uh, after 2011, and international community has uh, has the eye on Aung San Suu Kyi to speak out for this issue. What is his uh, her stand for the human right? But my question is, uh, what are also the expectations from international community? Because, because uh, we have been like uh, uh, closed our door until 2011, and a more than 85 or 94 percent of people are, we say, that uh, xenophobia. And uh, in this case, from the, also from the constitution, we can see 25 percent are guaranteed for the army, and besides, army has the right to recall the president. So 
my question is to international, all the international, what are your expectations for Myanmar to change into? Take those three? Uh, yes, yeah. please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for the question about Aung San Suu Kyi and what power does she have. I mean, obviously very limited in some areas, quite extensive in others. The military has got no interest in running healthcare, education, you know, all those kind of soft areas. Let the NLD do that and let them take the flack for the fact that education is appalling and healthcare. So all of that, NLD has extensive control. But when it comes to the sharp end of politics, of course, then it's much more contested. You said, you know, has she lost control of the military? No, because she certainly never had it. You know, I mean, the, the, the military has had control of the military all the way through, and these safeguards in the Constitution are there for a reason, which is that in, in the domains that really matter to the military, to do with national, the way they themselves describe it, national sovereignty, national solidarity, um, anything to do with kind of dissolution of the national people, then they retain control. I think the key question, I mean, the key question is about her voice. You know, she retains a voice, even though we know that she was not mobilizing the troops to engage in, that's, that's well known. But we also know that she's retained her voice through all of this, so why didn't she use it? In fact, why is she using it to say other things? Um, and I think there are two parts to that question. One is, what did she do with her voice behind closed doors, because this is a very delicate dance between, it's a power sharing agreement. Well, not really an agreement because it's in, imposed. She didn't agree to the terms, but it, it, implicitly she did by, by running for office and becoming state councillor. So what does she stay, say behind closed doors? You know, that's the one we don't have the answer to. We don't know what happened, for instance. On, on what day did she know that ethnic cleansing or something close to it was taking place in Rakhine State? Was it? August the 26th, was it September the 1st? We know that she gave a speech to the international community on September the 19th when she said that there's no more uh, targeting of civilians, everything is taking place within protocol, all of that. You know, when did she know? And what did she do on that day? You know, I mean, did she go to the commander in chief and say, um, I can no longer play this game. If you're gonna engage in ethnic cleansing, then we withdraw and you will be the ones who actually face the international community. Did she try that? I can imagine that maybe she did, and they called her bluff, because they know that she still sees herself as a, almost a messianic figure who can deliver long-term reform for Myanmar. So we don't know what happened internally. We do know what happened externally. I mean, what she said to her people, what she said to the international community, all of that, of course, is a matter of public record. And, and she hasn't stood up for the Rohingya. Why not? Why has this icon of democracy not stood up? I mean, partly because she's always said, I'm not an icon of democracy. She's always said, I'm a practical politician. She said it under house arrest. She continues to say it today. Don't put me up on a ped pedestal. Um, she also didn't speak out for very, very pragmatic reasons because the entire society would find it hard to live with Aung San Suu Kyi if she were to be seen as a defender of the rights of the Rohingya. And again, I think she believes that long term, she will be able to prove herself, that she will be able to guide her country to a more, even more tolerant, but certainly more progressive in other domains situation by just hanging on in there. She's not prepared to give it all up, I guess, for this one issue. Um, and, 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 and there's just a very stubborn streak in her. I mean, she, she simply does not take lectures from anybody, and particularly not from the international community. I mean, of course she, she has to be criticized, but she is a very, very, um, very resistant to all of that. She worked for the United Nations in the late 1960s before she was married. Um, when she became state councillor, she invited all the diplomats in Myanmar and all of the leaders of the UN agencies and NGOs to Naypyidaw and told them that she would be calling the shots now, not them, that anything they did in Myanmar, which is fine, I think, you know, it makes sense that they should be asked to fall in line with the government's priorities. Um, and she's, yes, yeah, she just does not take advice very kindly and particularly from from outsiders. I mean, look what she said to Mike Pence the other day when, when he talked about the persecution of the Rohingya and the fact that what the military had done could not be excused. She said, well, 
you probably understand your society better than anybody else does, and we understand our society better than anybody else does. It's kind of, let us deal with this. And, and, and she will not listen to, to lectures from anybody else. So th there is something deep in her character that's resistant to that. I don't know the answer to your question, I'm sorry. So I don't know when they started writing um, Myanmar, Burmese history in Burma. Um, I haven't gone that far, but that, back, that far back into history. Maybe I can answer your question, but I think you want everybody in the room to answer your question about what are the expectations of the international community. Yes, you're right that there was a contagion effect from the uh, Rohingya persecution in 2012 to other parts of the society. Um, I don't think that tells us anything positive about Myanmar. I mean, I think that tells us that there's a danger that even uh, more mainstream Muslim groups are now being uh, sidelined within the society. And this self-segregation that I mentioned at the neighborhood level is one instance of that. But what are the expectations? I, I mean, I, I think when it comes to Rakhine State, most of the international community would, would mobilize around Kofi Annan and that commission. So in August 2016, Aung San Suu Kyi asked Kofi Annan to lead a commission of inquiry into Rakhine State. He reported back within 12 months, as asked, the day before the Asa killings that triggered the ethnic cleansing. Um, 88 recommendations. Uh, looking at Rakhine as in totality and saying that Rakhine Buddhists are the poorest Buddhists in Myanmar. They need attention too. They need infrastructure. They need roads and schools and clinics and all of that. That we need to address this problem in the round. But as well as investing in the infrastructure for Rakhine State, they need to recognize the rights of the Rohingya to return. And never, also, she also never complained about the Myanmar military regimes. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe this is her correct character, but no, I'm not defending for her. But I mean, the, uh, the global international community is now how to call it accusing her. But the problem is, uh, Myanmar, how to call that, uh, uh, So, so are you asking the international communities to be more patient and wait? <laughs> I mean, I yes. Uh, yeah, after uh, since 1962 to 2011, so uh, international community is uh, hoping to see to change and to liberalize and to get into the democracy in within such a short period. Of course, I'm not defending for Aung San Suu Kyi. Okay. Yeah. So you are saying that uh, maybe not, the expectation yes. is too is too much for a country with such a difficult yes. history. Well, which is true too. On the, on the other hand, you know, when you look at the Rohingya people, I mean, each is each are they are not collective; they are individuals. And you see the um, the the dead bodies, the the, the um, all the cruelties that's inflicted on the people, and that's taking right right now. And something has to be done about these almost half a million people there. But 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 thank you for expressing your, your views. I have to give you the, the time to other uh, other questions. Okay, so we have. Um, I think I'll pick somebody who's sitting on the on the floor. So uh, the gentleman in the white shirt sitting on the floor. One. So the microphone goes there, and. Um, uh, 
and one, two, this gentleman in glasses, and uh, three, um, this lady with beautiful uh, brown hair. Please. If you would make Hello. your question short. Yes. Uh, my question having to do with uh, your research methodology and the mystery of why people believe in both democracy and dictatorship. Uh, as we all know that democracy is just a label, that different people believe in different democracies. And uh, my question is, when you did a survey uh, to f try to find out a particular respondent is a supporter of democracy or not a supporter, do you just ask the question, uh, do you support democracy, yes or no? Or you actually ask a set of different questions, and then from such a set of different questions, then you draw inference as to whether that particular respondent support or not support democracy. Thank, thank you. Thank you. There, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, countries where uh, the major, uh, the Kelavarayagalism, Buddhism are uh, uh, the majority. Uh, include Sri Lanka, Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos. Most of them are not a uh, full democratic country. So, uh, my question, do you think that uh, Theravada Buddhism uh, has a negative correlation with the democratization? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. Um, I've been working in Myanmar for about 20 years in the performing arts. And until the uh, election, all the performing artists were directed against the military government. I mean, all the commentary. So they were very united in that, and they had a single target in some ways. So now the targets become very diffuse. And I'm just wondering if the Rohingya have just become a convenient scapegoat. Um, and I don't. Uh, as things have not progressed as much as people want to in the society, that they shift their ire away from, as the militaries become less open uh, to a more vulnerable um, scapegoat. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. We, we did both of the things. We did ask them a direct question about democracy, but we also asked some other questions that indirectly could, could uh, open a window on their understanding and their commitment to democracy. So we tried to triangulate as much as possible. But the results I quoted about 2014, 2017, is our, is our country democratic today? That was, that was a direct question about, about democracy and their uh, self-perception of, of, the, of the state of, of politics. I wouldn't like to say that Theravada Buddhism is ne negatively cor correlated with democracy. Um, I think many other factors are coming into play. Um, you know, the, the worst examples of, of Buddhism and Buddhist violence are two of the countries you mentioned, Sri Lanka and, and Myanmar. And what they also have in common is their former British colonies, which were opened to inward migration on a scale that hadn't been witnessed before. I mean, Myanmar's always had Muslim communities, and you can trace it back a thousand years. What it hasn't, hadn't had until the British came was large-scale Muslim uh, settlement inside the country. And, and that is, in many ways, what has provoked. And that is, in many ways, what drives the agenda today, that um, this was not something done by us. This was a historical accident generated by imperialism. And we need to correct this historical injustice that has been visited upon us. That's a large part of the understanding inside Myanmar. If you, if you ask people, you know, what do you think stands behind all of this, they will take you back to the colonial period. And it is true that the size of the Muslim settlements in Myanmar uh, did change a lot in that period be because of this. Um, it, it wasn't that in Sri Lanka, they, the British brought the Tamil population in. Uh, to work in the plantations and things. That didn't happen in Myanmar, but it was just an opening of frontiers. Um, so I think that's probably more of a driver than the fact that these are Theravada Buddhist countries. And then on the performing arts, I don't think the Rohingya have become a convenient scapegoat as such. I mean, um, I didn't want to suggest that by today, in tw late 2018, Myanmar should be a, 
a, a kind of properly functioning Pacific democracy and everything should be perfect. I, I, I didn't want to say that. Of course, it was always going to be difficult. After such a difficult history, this was always going to be a difficult transition. But the persecution of the Rohingya did not have to be part of this story. Again, it has long historical roots, some of which I alluded to in response to the previous question. Um, so I, th I think the military has, has seen this as almost a historic opportunity to redress what it sees as this injustice within the society and the makeup of the society. I don't think it's actually um, coincidental that the current occupant of the White House takes very little interest in, in human rights or Southeast Asia or anything else. I mean, this opportunity may not come along again in such a great form as it has done uh, now when you've got um, a very unusual president of the United States. Um, if Hillary Clinton were in the White House today, I'm not sure that the military would have felt quite so emboldened to prosecute its agenda in 2017. So um, a lot of it's contingent, but I don't think the military needs a scapegoat. They're doing pretty well at the moment, actually. I mean, this deal with Aung San Suu Kyi is just perfect for them. Um, she's the front woman now for effectively a military-run state in all of the areas that matter to them, give away all the areas that don't matter to them. Um, as was said at the beginning, she's taking all of the flack, or much of it anyway. So they don't need a scapegoat right now. They, they like this system. Um, it's working out even better than they probably intended when they wrote the Constitution. There's a lot of food for thought. So we are not really quite sure whether it's Buddhism, which, which is negative for democracy, or it's actually a colonialism. <laughs> um, we have actually time only for the last round of, um, last round, absolutely last round. OK, um, let me see. Um, this gentleman over there in the pink shirt, and this lady in white. And the very last one. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, and this gentleman with a hat. And uh, if you promise also to be very short, <laughs> we have number four as well. And please all be very short. Otherwise, I don't think, I, I think they might turn off the lights. <laughs> all right. Um, yes, please. Thank you very much for a very learned, detailed talk. I know a lot more about Burma and Myanmar now than I did this morning. But a very simple question. I don't know the difference between Burma and Myanmar. Why did they change the name <laughs> and exactly when? Very good. And the second one, uh, yes, please. Can you tell us where you come from, uh, gentlemen? Yeah. I'm from America. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. People from Louisiana. Okay. Well, I'm from media. So my question is, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Holiday gave us a very good framework to understand Myanmar right now. So my question is, what's your suggestion uh, for the journalist if we want to do the report about uh, Myanmar? What's your suggestion uh, we can do uh, to help uh, people understand this country more? All right, very specific. OK, the third one is here, please. Uh, thank you for your great speech, uh, Professor Holliday. Let me ask a question about the, uh, the, the current uh, tr uh, tragedy happening with uh, Rohingya. Okay. Uh, how much to do with, we, we all know that the, this tragedy has really come from the uh, uh, ethnic conflict and uh, religious conflict. How much to do with the uh, Buddhist. You mentioned earlier that uh, the cur uh, nowadays uh, the the the, uh, the Buddhist monks, particularly the senior ones, they are more concerned about the threat uh, from outside, uh, Islamic threat in particular. Uh, we all know that the tragedy are mainly done by the government, the military in particular. Uh, but how, how what's the Buddhist Buddhism or Buddhist monk, the senior monks, their attitude? Because I always thought that the Buddhists are supposed to be very peaceful. Okay. Uh, my my second question, if I allow to ask, uh, very quick. Uh, this is a bit sensitive to ask uh, to ask a uh, British uh, scholar. Uh, why in history? Why uh, after the Second World War? Uh, 
the uh, the British government decided to uh, put the Rohingyas people and area into Burma instead of uh, uh, Bangladesh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, That's a history. Would the uh, British government have any responsibility on this? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the last one, please. My question is short for my curiosity. Hope you don't mind. Uh, were there any findings from your visiting Myanmar which influenced you to adjust your research or book writing? Uh, mm. All right, um, four questions together. So the first one, 1989 is the answer. That's when they changed it. So. That was why for many years it was not accepted. I mean, when Ceylon became Sri Lanka, the rest of the world didn't say, well, we're going to carry on saying Ceylon. They chose to fall in line with Sri Lanka. Uh, the United Nations almost immediately recognized Myanmar as the official name because it was changed by the official government. But the official government was, in 1989, the military junta that just in 1988 had crushed the democracy protest. So Aung San Suu Kyi held out for Burma for many years. Um, why did they change it? Well, it's only an English language change. So it's how do you call the country in English? It didn't change anything about the local language. It's, it's how should you translate that? And um, the feeling was that this was a better translation. If, if you like, it's a bit like the difference between Holland and the Netherlands. So Holland is just a component part of the Netherlands. So many people now, uh, the... the um, the first, the, the democratic prime minister in the 1950s was, was called Unu. And I saw his daughter at a conference, so parallel to Aung San Suu Kyi, also the daughter of, of that generation. And I saw his daughter at a conference sitting on stage like this about eight years ago. And somebody asked her, should we use Burma or Myanmar? And she said, of course, Myanmar. You know, when, when the generals first said Myanmar, we said Burma. Because when they said black, we said white. We just hated them so much. <laughs> but of course, Myanmar makes more sense because, in fact, you know, the, the language, if you ask Myanmar people to describe their language, Myanmar Zagar is, is the name for their language. It's, it's the language of the Myanmar people. And, and whereas Burma is just that majority ethnic group. So Myanmar makes a lot more sense. Even Aung San Suu Kyi now says, use whichever one you like. You know, she no longer sees it as an article of faith that people hold on to Burma. I should just say, in changing that name, they changed many other names. So Rangoon to Yangon. And, and some of them are quite contentious because the names of the official ethnic minorities sometimes changed. And sometimes those official ethnic minorities say, we prefer the old one. Now, it shouldn't be that they be the ones to actually decide how they should be called in English. So there's still a lot of debates. Secondly, um, how should we report on Myanmar? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. I mean, it, it uh, feeds into my interest in, in, in kind of taking paintings around the world and, and using them as a means of opening up perspectives and conversations. I, th I think there need to be more kind of slice of life, um, journalistic pieces from Myanmar. I mean, not, not just, just responding to whatever the latest crisis is or, or set piece. I mean, the 2020 general election will be an occasion. But actually reporting, you know, the life of the Myanmar people and how they see things and how they want to tell their story to the wider world. I think those are the sorts of things. I mean, the crisis stuff is done brilliantly by Human Rights Watch, Inter Amnesty International, the UN, everything. And you can get endless reports on that. But getting a sense of what makes Myanmar people tick and what, what are their concerns. I mean, what we asked and also the Asian, Asia Foundation asked and also the Asian barometer asked, what is the, most, the biggest challenge facing our country today? And we all asked that question in the middle of the 2010s before the Rohingya crisis. And the number one answer was fixing the economy and improving people's life prospects. Second on the list was democracy and political reform in all of those surveys. So you would never know that from reading the international media on Myanmar. You think everybody is somehow kind of mobilized by politics, that they're all marching on the streets either for democracy years ago or anti-Rohingya today. They're not. They're getting on with their lives and they want the best they can for their kids and all of that. And, and that needs to be got across much, much more. I mean, the big failure of the NLD government is that it hasn't done much 
for economic development in these last two and a half years. And that's why in the by-elections three weeks ago and in the general election in 2020, they are struggling. Um, nobody's criticizing them in Myanmar for ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya. That's a positive. But for failing to really get a grip on the economy, uh, to tackle the crony capitalism that came from the junta years, people are very, very critical of that. The third question was um, the Rohingya conflict. You, you said something about threat from outside. I mean, that's exactly how it's cast. The, the, the whole point about the Rohingya is that they are not seen as an organic part of Myanmar society. Everybody else is part of the family. Name any one of the other 135 official ethnic groups uh, going to the extremities of Kachin state or Shan state, but they're still part of the family. They may have a different identity from the Bamar or whatever, but they belong. The Rohingya are not seen, they are a threat from outside. I mean, they've always been seen as a threat from outside. They are an alien force inside Myanmar. That is the, that is the discourse. And so they are an alien threat which is seen as being funded from outside, from Pakistan, from, from the Middle East. Um, they are now seen as a terrorist threat which fits in and again with global discourse. So everything is cast as, as, as a cleansing of the society from an external threat, even though many of these people have been living there for for decades or generations. And finally, was there anything in our research that made us change our minds? Yes, everything. I mean, it was entirely data-driven. We didn't come in expecting to, we, we, we started off by saying there's democratization, there's intolerance, which became ethnic cleansing when we were writing. Um, but we didn't have a kind of preconceived destination. We, we wanted to be driven by what we found and, and everything I presented was, was what we found, um, which did shape our conclusion. So, yeah, everything was, was shaped by what was in the data. Um, we started this Taipei Salon 14 years ago. And if we're talking about Myanmar being a community, being a country, which is so for so five decades close up to the world, ignored and misunderstood by the world community, well, so is Taiwan. So we also have the need to... Uh, to let the world know our stories as well. So the Taipei Salon, we do international, we do global issues, especially for our younger generation. Uh, considering the situation Taiwan is in, we do need even wider perspective being brought in here. And that is why we are doing what we do. Um, thanks to our holiday, yes that um, my colleagues, they feel very much encouraged by your attendance today, and especially by Ian Holiday, who really flew here and does do the talk, and he is leaving tomorrow. But Ian, you want to say more, please? Well, A, I want to say thanks very much. It's been extremely stimulating being here. I'm, again, grateful to Ying Tai for making this possible. It's, it's been absolutely fabulous. I want to say one other thing, which is, Paintings, and I, you know, I, I take paintings around the world. I've got 75 on display in Singapore. I've got two exhibitions in the States. I've got 200 paintings on public display around the world. I would like to bring some paintings to Taiwan. <laughs> if, if, if anybody would like to, to help with that end, endeavor, you know, put me in touch. I, I, I typically work with universities because I think... Yeah, we have museum people here today. Well, whatever. <laughs> But I've got more than a thousand Myanmar paintings, pretty much all of them painted in, the, in this transitional period. So whilst 200 are on public display, 800 are not. Um, and I'd like to display some of those here in Taiwan. So if anybody can help with that, please send me an email and we'll, we'll work on it together. You, we definitely will. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so for the Taipei Salon, you could, if you have the time, you can become volunteers for the, with the foundation. If you have money, you can donate. And if you have ideas, tell us. And if you have speakers who are as exciting as Ian Holiday, let us know. Uh, we'll see you next time. But let's thank uh, Ian Holiday with a very warm applause. Thank you so much.